Okay, well, good morning this 5th of July. Um, some of you, well, not those who are tuning in now, some of you who will tune in later, I'm sure, are in warm climes, enjoying the summer, even if under restrictions. We're in Melbourne, where today is not as cold as last Sunday was, but we're in our winter, and all of you in Australia will know that um, we've had a big glitch in our suppression of COVID-19. And so several of our suburbs, I think now 12, are in lockdown. And probably hardest of all is that nine tower blocks of Housing Commission flats are in total lockdown for at least five days because there's been a real spread of the virus there. So those of us who are not in those suburbs are feeling sad for them and spoiled and yeah, hoping and praying that we can get back on top of the virus which seems to have got away from our, yeah, from our people. Um, I hope most of you are in a better place and um, thank you for joining us, whether now, live or later on at a time which is not the middle of the night for you. Um, I'm glad again that we have one other person with us today in church and that's Suzanne. It really is nice for us not to be just on our own. Okay, so I see the clock is ticking to 11 and I'll hand over to Graham. Well, thank you, Christine. And uh, a warm welcome to Blackburn Presbyterian Church once again. We've been streaming this modified style of service now since uh, I think it was the 22nd of March uh, as a consequence of the coronavirus pandemic that Christine's just been alluding to. I'm Graham Bradbeer. Uh, Christine is my wife. We also have taking part in the service uh, Suzanne, whom Christine mentioned, and uh, by recording we'll have Amanda present with us in a moment or two. We're delighted that you've joined with us as well uh, to connect, and we pray that you with us will enjoy sharing the good things that God has given to us that flow from the good news of Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to know more about uh, our church, you can visit the church webpage, blackburnpc.org.au, and you'll be able to download the weekly leaflet, which contains, among other things, the notes of the sermon that I will shortly share with you. We've actually been following Matthew's Gospel, and we're in the middle of his last great collection of Jesus' teachings, and it's uh, chapters 23, 24, and next week, chapter 25. I've called this morning's uh, sermon, uh, rather cryptically, Waiting for the Midwife, and I hope you'll see why when we get to it. But in the meantime, uh, I'm going to invite you to chill and listen to Amanda playing Concerto by Telemann, and uh, let this still your soul.
Beautiful. Shall we pray together as we worship God? Let us unite our hearts in prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for the privilege of drawing near to you. And we thank you for the privilege of connecting with each other. And we ask that as we bow before you, you will draw near to us, not because of any inherent attraction in us, but because we have come in the name of Jesus, the one who perfectly embodied all that you had in mind for your human family, the one who gave himself the perfect offering on behalf of a wayward people. We thank you that he came, that sins might be forgiven, and that the message of this forgiveness might be spread around the whole world. Today we pray that from churches everywhere, the message of Jesus will stream out into the world and that people will hear it and come to the feet of the Prince of Peace and the King of Kings. Be with us now and accept our worship for his name's sake. Amen. I'm going to hand back to Christine. She has a little treat for you this morning. Well, last week, um, Monday and Tuesday, we spent in Port Ferry with our oldest daughter and her three children. For those of you who live outside Victoria, Port Ferry is a lovely beach town in Western Victoria, which has interesting names such as the Belfast Bakery. So a lot of Irish settlers there originally and many Scots too. The weather and the sea were too chilly for us to go into the water, which we normally love. So we had to find other activities. Now, thankfully, just before we left, Graham found two kites in our garage. And he and Liam, our grandson, tried them out. Both were stunt kites. And one proved almost impossible to use. The other one was hard to use, but I just arrived on the scene as they were having some success. And I was incredibly excited to see Liam flying it. And we're going to show a tiny video clip, and it's embarrassing, but you'll hear my excitement accompanying the clip. I have no idea what I was about to say, or whether it was cut off, I don't know. Anyway, the next day, Liam and his mum spent all of $3 in an op shop and got a more basic kite, which flew much higher and for longer. And we have photographic evidence of that. If you can see in the bottom right-hand corner, there's Liam, and you see how high the kite is, and it's not crashing to the ground. So I'm hoping that soon, COVID-19 and time and everything else permitting, Liam and his grandpa will soon have opportunities to work a bit more on the stunt kites. Now, it's been suggested, and I don't think it's too long a shot, that Christians are a bit like kites in that we come in all shapes, sizes and colours. The Bible fleshes out for us the great diversity that existed already among the membership of the first century church. If you look up Galatians 3.28, you'll read, For in Christ Jesus you are all children of God, through faith there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Another way in which I think we could say that kites give us an image of what it's like to be a Christian, we are guided and held steady 
by the hands of our trustworthy and strong and loving Master. In the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 27 to 30, Jesus refers to his followers as his sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. And now's the bit about the hands steadying the kite. No one will snatch them out of my hand. We all know that wind can snatch the ropes of the kite out of the guiding hands. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. So, in what remains of the winter school holidays here in the Southern Hemisphere, and in the much longer summer holidays in the north, may we all enjoy kite flying, whether as participants or observers. And as we do so, let us be grateful for the diversity of the Christian church and the love which will not let us go. May God bless us all. Suzanne is going to bring us our Bible reading. Thank you, Suzanne. Good morning, everyone. Today's reading is Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 to 25. The destruction of the temple and signs of the end times. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to to its buildings. Do you see all these things? he asked. Truly I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said. When will this happen, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, claiming, I am the Messiah, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumours of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetop go down to take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath, for then there will be great distress, unequalled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equalled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. At that time, if anyone says to you, Look, here is the Messiah, 
or there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you ahead of time. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Suzanne. Thanks be to God indeed. And it is a challenging passage uh, this morning. We've been following the root markers, as I call them, in, in uh, Matthew's Gospel, and we've even picked up a few root markers around Melbourne. Uh, I mentioned last week this very distinctive one, uh, turn right from the left-hand side of the road only, and we've used that as uh, this final root marker in Matthew's Gospel. And in Matthew's Gospel, they're literary root markers, so that if the careful reader is reading the Gospel, they will come to the end of the Sermon on the Mount and find these words when Jesus had finished these words. Uh, and reading on, we'll discover the same phrase at the end of chapter 10, at the beginning of chapter 11, verse 1, when Jesus had finished teaching his disciples. And then reading on at the end of uh, chapter 13, after the big block of teaching about the parables, when Jesus had finished these parables. And as we go on, Jesus finished these words at the end of uh, chapter 18. And now in chapter 26, uh, when Jesus had finished all these words. And we've got another three, these three chapters. Chapter 23, which we looked at last week, which you might remember was about the, uh, the terrible danger of hypocrisy. And then uh, the... Uh, chapter that we're looking at today in the middle of this section, chapter 24, which Suzanne has just read to us, and then next week uh, we'll look at chapter 25. So I've called this Waiting for the Midwife. Let's just see how these headings uh, can help us with this theme. First of all, time up for the temple. You can imagine these headings have actually just come out of, uh, of one of the versions of the Bible that I was using at the time. Time up for the temple, fake news and false messiahs, the monster of desecration, Sit, let the reader understand, you heard uh, Suzanne say when Jesus refers to Daniel, the arrival of the Son of Man, it's getting really interesting at this point, and then uh, the unexpected coming. So these five headings, I hope, will help us as we go through this passage of Scripture and get deeper into uh, the teaching of Jesus. Well, in his lament at the end of the previous chapter, weeping over Jerusalem and yearning to gather her people like a mother hen gathered its chickens under its wings for safety, Jesus uh, we weeps uh, in his heart over the city that is rejecting him. And he says, your house will be left to you abandoned and desolate. And their house was the temple, of course. It was the place, the physical location, where the tribes of Israel would come to worship their unseen God. Remarkably of the ancient world, most of the gods were seen and visible. But in Israel, there was a physical location, but the rooms bore no image of God because the people themselves were in God's image. The site, of course, is familiar to us. This is an aerial shot of uh, the Temple Mountain today. It's got the Dome of the Rock in the middle of it. It's the old temple site, but the temple was torn down. When will that happen, said the disciples? And what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? Two questions which the disciples asked. I want you to notice that uh, the word parousia, which is the word for coming, or arriving, or being present. Uh, that word occurs four times in this chapter, right near the beginning and then a little later on. And I'll draw your attention to it. But in verse 3, the question is, what will be the sign of your arrival, or your presence, or your coming? And so, how do we understand the arrival of the Son of Man is important to our understanding of the whole chapter? Now, the chapter itself is a coded answer to these two questions. And it comes with the warning 
that there will be fake messiahs and fake news. Let's think about that. There'll be wars and rumors of wars. This isn't the end. Things will be continuing much as they have. It's the same old, same old for humanity. The headlines will relate to wars and disasters. And there'll be difficult times ahead, Jesus says, for those who follow him from his disciples. They will hate you, he says, because of me. It's not the kind of thing we expect. But it is interesting that a recent British government report uh, commissioned by the Department of uh, Foreign Affairs and Commonwealth uh, has exposed the fact that 80% of persecution of religious minorities in the world is of Christians. Well, they will hate you because of me. Th this doesn't mean that the end has come in verse 6. In fact, it's only the beginning, the birth pangs. So, so I've called it waiting for the midwife because the clarity about this is only going to emerge as the disciples themselves wait and receive the Holy Spirit to open their eyes about what has happened among them. The Holy Spirit is the midwife and will bring to birth a whole new era of human history in which Christ the King will be made known throughout the whole world. Verse 14 says that. So if you've got an open Bible, you might like to follow it. I'm going to refer to some verses because it's a little bit demanding. So the, let the reader understand. And he refer, Jesus refers explicitly to the book of Daniel. So we've got fake news, false messiahs, and now Jesus is referring to the book of Daniel and to that monster of desecration, the abominable thing that happens. Now we've... Uh, Notice that Jesus uses the expression son of man of himself. And I've mentioned in a previous uh, sermon that this is an ambiguous title. Ezekiel uses it to mean just human being. Because that's what it means. It means a human being. But Daniel uses it to speak of a human being who enters into the presence of God and is given a kingdom. One like unto a human being. And it's an enigmatic uh, appearance that Daniel speaks of but he says the reader should understand this that Jesus is quoting that passage of the book of Daniel it's in chapter 9 and it's verses 26 and 27 of the book of Daniel and this reference to Daniel encrypts the message but it also just read this week that or heard on the news that uh, an encryption of fake phones had been discovered in the United Kingdom in Europe that enabled police and uh, to, to uh, capture large numbers of people who were engaging in criminal activity. So the, in, the breaking and encryption is an important thing, but Jesus has encrypted his message, but it also provides a kind of key to understanding for those who know the Jewish scriptures, who can look back to Daniel. And the history of these verses was... Uh, understood in uh, the, the Jewish books of Maccabees as relating to an event which happened 160 years before Christ. You might have heard of the Maccabee Games. It's a nickname that was given to uh, a group of brothers who fought against uh, the tyranny of Greek oppression. There was a man who called himself Antiochus Epiphanes. It really means uh, the shining of God, divine shining one. And he had, he had the, the title divine put on his, on his coins. And he eventually put down a revolt. But before that, he, 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 he then displayed an image in the temple in Jerusalem, which, which caused this Maccabee brothers to rise up. So 160 years before Jesus, there was what appeared to be this desecration of the temple, a sacrilegious uh, Gentile pagan uh, um, asserting himself as divine in God's temple in Jerusalem. Now, that wasn't the only thing that happened because, of course, the Romans came in and crushed and subjugated the Jewish people after the Greeks. And, and so the, the story of the Jewish people was one of frequent um, messianic pretenders rising up or would-be messiahs. And right through... Uh, through to the year 120, this was happening. And at the end of the Jewish-Roman War, 
in the year 70, a war that lasted several years and was chronicled by the Jewish historian Josephus, uh, who reported on the war for the Romans. Uh, it's clear that uh, Jesus had, is advising his disciples when they see this desecration happening in their lifetime, they have to flee to the mountains, they have to get away from there, they have to pray that it won't happen uh, on the Sabbath day, and they have to pray. Uh, woe to those who are uh, nursing mothers or pregnant women at that time. It'll be a time of destruction and desolation. And Josephus tells us that when the Romans finally destroyed the Jerusalem temple in the year 70, uh, innumerable people were killed. The, the death toll was unimaginably high. The figure that I heard quoted was so high that I thought, well, he couldn't have counted them. Uh, and so it was a number too great to count, and, uh, but it, it speaks of uh, terrible bloodshed. Now this wasn't a new thing. It had happened in a sense in Jewish history before. And there were to be subsequent holocausts and pogroms uh, for people of Jewish origin. But in this one in particular, a breach was to take place. The temple was totally destroyed and it has never been rebuilt. Where was God now? Where was the uh, answer to this terrible thing that had happened? If we go back to Daniel, we read there in uh, chapter 9, verses 26 and 27, the anointed one, that is the actual word is Mashiach, the Hebrew word for Messiah, the anointed one will be put to death and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and its sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. So this is what Daniel has predicted. And this is what Jesus is claiming for himself. As he, in this final uh, presentation of, of his material and of his teaching in the book of Matthew, is about to enter into his final conflict with the authorities, with the powers of darkness, with those who would rather war and wage peace. So the arrival of the Son of Man then, what is this? Well, the terms that Jesus uses to answer the question of the coming of the Son of Man in verses 29 through to 31 are typical of Jewish apocalyptic literature. They're not to be taken literally. If you take them literally with the uh, sun being darkened and the moon turning to blood and so on, then you've got a kind of cosmic weather forecast which makes nonsense of it. It is what we call a manner of speaking. But it's a poetic expression of a terrible social convulsion. Let me try and open up this idea just a little bit. Michael Lunig uh, had a cartoon, just uh, two images in black and white in the newspaper many years ago. And when I went looking for it on the internet, I couldn't find it, but I found a one minute clip. I'm not going to use the one minute clip, but I've taken uh, four stills from it. It's called The Tightrope Walker. And it begins like this, with a little man on a tightrope. Perhaps you find it difficult to see there. In the, but, but he's there and the stars are in the sky and he gets distracted as he watches a falling star. And as he starts to move across his tightrope, he's getting a little further. But by this time, there's few stars on the ground as well as in the sky. And as he goes a little further, he seems to lose his footing and there are no stars left in the sky and he's on the ground. He's fallen. No stars in the sky. So Michael Lunig is telling us about a disaster. It's a, the word aster is the word for star in Latin. We get the English word disaster from a de-starring of the sky. And, and it's not just a newspaper cartoonist who, who can talk about this. You might know uh, Michael, uh, sorry, W.H. Uh, Auden's poem, Stop All the Clocks, that was made popular in the, in the movie Four Weddings and a Funeral. I was reminded of it recently. Uh, and, and Auden's poem uh, concludes with these words. The stars are not wanted now. Put out every one. Pack up the moon and dismantle the sun. Pour away the ocean and sweep up the wood, for nothing now can ever come to any good. So the idea of sweeping away 
uh, the, the moon and the sun and the stars uh, is uh, there in our poetic traditions as well. Stop all the clocks. And, and if we go a little further, we ask ourselves, well, what, what about in the Greek and the Hebrew tradition, the idea of parousia? Well, I say Greek tradition because it wasn't just in the Bible. Outside of the Bible, they had the idea of parousia as well. When the emperor visited a city, for example, if he was to be uh, going to uh, Philippi, which was a Roman colony, his approach, the, uh, the people would go out to welcome him. The streets would be decorated. They would... Uh, it would be a magnificent and wonderful occasion, the arrival of the emperor. So in the, in the Jewish tradition, the parousia, the arrival of the Son of Man, is what Jesus is drawing our attention to. And now that word parousia appears several times. But you'll notice we're thinking about Daniel. And in Daniel, it's the arrival of in heaven, as it were, in the presence of the Ancient of Days, a way of thinking about the divine presence, God, God's presence. Here is one like a human one in the presence of God, a son of man. And he's come from earth to heaven, not the other way around. That's a challenge. So Jesus is using the language of heaven to tell us of a great disaster, a destarring of the sky, uh, a coming of darkness, and it's a coming to the ancient of days into heaven from earth. And if this is the way we should think about this, the presence or coming of the Son of Man in the clouds of heaven is most likely a reference to Jesus having confidence that when he journeyed into Jerusalem to encounter the darkness of evil the opposition that would awaited him there, his death would be followed by an ascension into the presence of the Ancient of Days. I'm saying he staked his life on the truth of what Daniel said, that this was what the Messiah had to do. He had this confidence. It had served him well throughout his ministry. And he wasn't going to turn from it at the end. That he would present, be presented with a kingdom. That's the first thing. I've given these th next three points a little star to suggest there's going to be a restarring of the sky, if you like. He is given by the Ancient of Days authority and royal powers that all people of all nations, languages would serve him. His authority would last forever and his kingdom would never end. It's Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. You can see how, how laced with uh, the ideas from Daniel, as, as we've also seen from Isaiah and uh, Jeremiah, these ideas are informing Jesus' behavior and his teaching. Matthew records that the Son of Man will send his angels. So this is all coming on that generation. That generation will experience this. The disciples have to face this, that there's something about to happen to the people alive at that time uh, and that he is going to receive a kingdom and it will affect them and that his messengers will be sent into all the world. The word messenger appears in the text as angels. But you must remember that the word angelos, the Greek language, means messenger. Often a divine messenger. But in this case, just as likely the disciples themselves, who will be the messengers of a new age. The vision of Daniel and the words of Jesus in this chapter propel our minds forward. How does Matthew end his gospel? I'm sure many of you know this off by heart. Jesus saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all the nations, teaching them all I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Well, this is the beginning of that age. Jesus has it in mind. And Matthew is going to take us there. But first, Jesus himself has to go into the darkness. He has to experience the loss of all hope and the trauma that that entails in himself. Which brings us to the unexpected coming. Now, some of the expressions in this chapter may sound familiar. The trumpet will sound. 
One will be taken and another left behind. It'll be like a thief in the night. And much of this vocabulary has come to us linked to particular interpretation of the end times, an issue that's, in fi that's fired up the curiosity and imagination of believers and unbelievers alike and has led to innumerable end time narrative reconstructions. Some of us have lived through some of them. You might remember David Koresh or perhaps uh, certain others that used the internet in the early days of the internet. So there have been uh, believers and unbelievers and all sorts of people trying to imagine how they should live their lives. However, the social catastrophe envisaged will come unexpectedly. Jesus emphasizes this. He says in verse 36, it will be unexpected. And by his reference to Noah's flood toward the end of the chapter, he says that came upon that generation. They were not ready for it. And by his reference to a thief, he's got a story at the end of the chapter, if you've got your Bible open, verse 43, that the thief came in the night. And if the, if the householder had been aware that a thief was coming, it wouldn't have happened. But this is going to happen unexpectedly. And it just could be that to be taken might have been the worst thing that could have been happening and another left. Although in so many reconstructions of the end time, people imagine that to be taken would be a good thing. But in, these, in the narrative that we've been looking at, it might be that to be taken by the uh, thing that was bringing destruction on Jerusalem would be the worst thing that could happen. But the important thing is no one knows the hour that Jesus is talking about now. He's saying what is absolutely important is to continue faithfully. Jesus gives emphasis to this by telling a story about an absent master who entrusted his household to a servant. There were two servants in the, story, the telling of the story. One was a good servant who found nourishing and uh, uh, caring ways of using his master's resources to help the whole household. But the other was a wicked servant who misused the master's resources to benefit himself. And he will share the condemnation, says Jesus, of the hypocrites, which is what last week's reflection was about. Israel was to be God's servant. In Isaiah 41, Israel, you are my servant. What's happened? From Israel, salvation was to flow out to all the nations. You get this in John's Gospel where Jesus says uh, to the woman at the well, uh, salvation is of the Jews. It was to come through the Jewish line. And we know from the very beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, that the blessing that God had in mind was to go to all the nations. But like the wicked servants, the custodians of Israel's law and temple had abused their privilege and indulged themselves the behavior Jesus had denounced. Jesus the Messiah steps into the part of Israel. He is the true servant. He is the Lord of whom Isaiah speaks. He went to the city and to the temple to be rejected, scorned, beaten, labeled as the king of the Jews, and killed. Will his disciples remain true to his teaching? Will they be mindful of their absent master, actively serving his people? When the master comes home, will his servants be faithful and wise servants? Or will we be bad servants who have made, who've made the master's domain a place of our own leisure and debauchery? Jesus, in Jesus we have a king who entered the darkness unimaginable that the loving message of sins forgiven would reach into the world. Do our lives bear witness to the reign of that king? What kind of servants are we? In Waiting for the Midwife, J.R.R. Tolkien invented a word, and the word he invented was eucatastrophe. He calls the incarnation of Christ the good reversal in human history. And he calls the resurrection 
the U catastrophe of the incarnation. And according to Wikipedia, U catastrophe has an, an inherent connection to an optimistic view of the unfolding events in the narrative of the world. We are invited to the most uh, optimistic view of what will happen in the future, that God has plans to rescue and restore and redeem his world. And we must share this with our friends and our neighbors. May we, may we be found to be those good servants in the master's absence. Amen. I'm now going to lead us in prayer. And uh, our opening prayer comes from the Barnabas prayer notes. And I uh, invite you to join with me in prayer. Let us pray. O oh God of hope, please fill us with joy and peace as we trust in you. In a world of uncertainty and anxiety, when many are mourning for loved ones, when many have lost their means of livelihood, when old familiar ways of living may be gone forever, where the new normal is as yet unknown, and where persecution of your followers looks set to increase, please make us people who overflow with hope by the power of your Holy Spirit. With the rise in coronavirus cases in Victoria, we're mindful of people experiencing renewed lockdown with the attendant frustration, inconvenience and isolation, especially people experiencing total lockdown in tower blocks. Guide and strengthen all responsible for their welfare. May they be well cared for as we seek their health and the health of the whole community. We pray for the safety of all families with school-aged children. May kids be sheltered from the harshest aspects of the pandemic and find simple joys in everyday things. And for the elderly and all with pre-existing conditions who are feeling vulnerable and fearful or struggling with the psychological challenges of isolation, that your comfort and reassurance will reach to them this week. These things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who taught us to say together, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amanda is going to bring our service to a close with the uh, jig by Bath. And I chose to put this at the end of the service because of its optimism. Thank you, Amanda. May we dance through the week in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Lord, may your grace, your mercy and your peace rest upon us and remain with us and those whom we love today and all the days. 
now and forever. Amen.